Hey everyone, today we're talking about Pauper, my favorite format. I'm sure you've heard of this format, and I'm also sure you've heard about how cheap it is to get into. I love how cheap it is, it's fantastic. I'm gonna take a dive into the format as a whole and then look at some popular decks and strategies to hopefully give you an idea of, you know, what you wanna play, what's kind of available, what's out there, right? Um, so let's start with the basics. Popper is a 60 card constructed format where only commons are legal. And this includes cards that were downshifted to common, like Mortician Beetle. And when I say common, I mean, every common going all the way back to alpha alpha that's crazy what what other format what other format what are you playing legacy come on you're not playing legacy <laughs> so popper has a ban list just like every other format and recently the popper format panel made up of seven experts uh, was created to help wizards with bannings and things like that now, someone might hear commons only, roll their eyes, think they can pick up some draft chaff, and have a, you know, competitive tune deck. And that is just, it's just not true. It's so, so far from the truth. Ugh. <laughs> Popper has access to cards modern players dream of. You know, Faithless Looting, uh, Ponder. Uh, all the artifact lands for you affinity players. Uh, and then the Blasts, you know, Hydro and Pyro. And some players might even find that their favorite strategies are available in Pauper. Uh, you know, things like uh, Elves, Tron, Boggles, and Affinity, like I had just mentioned. So, with all that in mind, uh, I want to take a look at some popular decks and kind of go over their strategies. As a side note, I won't really be going over uh, sideboards, because they're just so meta-dependent. Uh, and if you really like any of these decks, uh, there's a ton of channels that I would recommend. Uh, you know, uh, channels like uh, Snapbolt, uh, Popperganda, Thraben Yu, uh, Andrea Meganucci on Channel Fireball. He does a ton of great stuff. And those guys are great for like a deeper dive and you really get to, you know, see how these decks play out. So let's get into some strategies. So just as a note before I get started, I wanted to let everyone know how I made the decisions on what decks to include in this video. And basically I went on to MTG Goldfish and looked at the Pauper metagame and tried to include as many decks as I could possibly cram into a single video. Uh, so it might be a, a lot, but uh, I think it's worth it and it will definitely give you an idea of what's going on right now. So, first off, we have Affinity. This deck looks to flood the board with artifacts for great payoffs. Usually comes in a Rakdos red-black or Grixis red-black-blue flavor. Uh, so some popular cards. Uh, the artifacts that you're going to be running will include cards like Blood Fountain, Ikor Wellspring, and Chromatic Star. These are all very cheap and provide either advantage or utility. The fact that Blood Fountain creates two artifacts for one mana is absolutely insane. For payoffs, we have Disciple of the Vault, Frogmite, and Mirror Enforcer. So these cards are going to really run the deck and either enable your beatdown strategy or, in Disciple of the Vault's case, ping down your opponents. For advantage engines, you're typically running Deadly Dispute, which is an absolutely insane and busted card, and Thoughtcast if you are running blue, another just fantastic card. Lastly, you're running the Artifact Lands, uh, both the Modern Horizons 2 and the Mirrodin Block Artifact Lands for even more synergy, lets you get off those affinity cards like even earlier. I think at this point it is a central core of the deck is those artifact lands. Next up we have the fairy archetype. So it's actually three decks that are all kind of centered around the same thing. These are control decks that run a lot of counter magic like spell stutter sprite and counter spell, right? Comes in three different color combinations. You have red blue is it, blue black demir, and most recently, Mono Blue. So in Neon Dynasty, the archetype got Moon Circuit Hacker, which really enables the Mono Blue variant and is an incredible card. 
It runs the standard control package, Ponder, Brainstorm, Counterspell, and Spell Pierce. So for the Is It Scred version, this will pack uh, Bolts and Scred to deal with creatures that kind of made it past your Spell Stutter Sprites, or in the case of Lightning Bolt, just deal that last bit of direct damage to close out games, and is obviously running the Snowlands for Scred. When it comes to Demir, you are playing a lot more creature hate to ensure that your opponents never even have a board presence for you to worry about, and will run Gurmog Angler, a fantastic card that you will see in a ton of decks because it flexes in so well. Then we have my personal favorite deck, Boros Monarch. This deck looks to flood the board and abuse the graveyard through flashback cards like Prismatic Strands, Battle Screech, and Faithless Looting. There are two main bird cards that you're going to be running in this deck, and that would be Squadron Hawk, which you can use in conjunction with Faithless Looting to pitch away quote-unquote dead cards. There is also Battle Screech, which will generate a ton of tokens, and if you have one untapped white creature, you can make four birds for four mana, which is a fantastic rate for just one card. The deck generates value through the aforementioned Faithless Looting. Palace Sentinels, uh, the Monarch mechanic, is very strong and pauper, and you see it all over the place. And Thraven Inspector, which is just a classic card that spans multiple formats. It can really win out of nowhere with a single Rally of the Peasants and some birds. You know, it's not hard to push through 15 damage when you have four birds on the board, right? Lastly, you're playing Seeker of the Way, which fits perfectly into this deck. You're playing a ton of non-creature spells, and that lifelink helps you stay in the game long enough to pull off your big plays and close out the game. Moving on to Burn, <laughs> the deck I just mentioned. Uh, it is pretty straightforward. You know, it plays damaging spells to kill the opponent. If you've played any other Eternal format, I'm sure you've gone up against this before. So Burn goes fast, dies hard, and then you cry <laughs> if Weather the Storm is played because Watsi is too afraid to print Skullcrack at Common. <laughs> So like I had said earlier, Burn is very, very similar to Burn decks in other formats. Uh, the special Pauper Spice that you're going to be throwing in will be Needle Drop, Fire Blast, and Thermo Alchemist. Some cards that you would definitely be familiar with would be Lightning Bolt, obviously, Lava Spike, Searing Blaze, Rift Bolt, Skewer the Critics, Right, like the shell is very, very similar to a legacy or modern burn deck. Moving on to boggles, get ready to suit up. <laughs> You're gonna take a hexproof creature and make it as big as humanly possible through auras. So in this deck, you're going to be running a lot of creatures. Like I had said, they all have hexproof. The deck is named after Slippery Bogle but you're also running Solana Ledgewalker and Glade Cover Scout, right? Then for suiting up, you know, putting all those auras on your creature, you know, you're running Armadillo Cloak, Ethereal Armor, and Rancor. Other enchantments like Utopia Sprawl are also used in this deck as a form of ramp because there are a lot of Enchantment Matters cards, right? Then we come up to Mono Black Control. This deck looks to control your opponent via, you know, discard effects, edict effects, making them sacrifice stuff, and good old removal. And then it tries to beat down with its creatures or drain out the opponent with a Grey Merchant of Osphodel. So for creatures here, we're running Kumbaj Witches, Chittering Rats, Grey Merchant of Osphodel, like I had mentioned earlier, and Gurmog Angler again. Spells, you know, Chainer's Edict. Geth's Verdict, getting those sacrifice effects, which really helps get around creatures that have, you know, protection or hexproof, right? And then in just terms of good old removal, you're running Cast Down and Defile. This deck gains advantage through cards like Sign in Blood or Thorn of the Black Rose. Again, another Monarch card. See that mechanic coming back a lot. And Phyrexian Ranger. It also inherently gains value from all of your opponent's cards being in the graveyard and not letting them play anything. 
So that'll about wrap it up for all the bigger decks. And I wanted to move on to some more honorable mentions, things you don't see as often, but are either fan favorites or just popular, right? So first off, we have Rainbow Tron. This deck did just get hit recently, but people still love to play it. People love the number seven, right? Uh, <laughs> obviously, it is running the Tron lands to generate a ton of mana, and it looks to outvalue your opponents with cards like Moldrifter and Wallop long enough to, you know, infinitely blink creatures with Archaeomancer and Ephemerate, or just play big old stupid Eldrazi spells, right? Some things never change. Then we have Naya Slivers. This deck makes a lot of slivers that get big and go fast with cards like Muscle Sliver, Gemhide Sliver, and Sinew Sliver. Then we have Jun Cascade. Very fun, a mid-range deck that ramps with the Cleansing Wildfire and Indestructible Land interaction to cast Cascade creatures like Boarding Party for big turns. Next we have Red Black Storm. This deck is the most expensive deck in Popper. Uh, <laughs> it's like showing up to a punk show with a Rolex. It's, uh <laughs> But it's sweet. It's very cool. This deck is trying to play a ton of rituals like Rite of Flame and Dark Ritual, plus a ton of draw spells like Manamorphose and Knight's Whisper to eventually lead you into a huge storm turn with Galvanic Relay which can then finish off opponents with Kessig Flame Breather. Then we have Orzov Pestilence, a pauper classic. So you're just trying to play Pestilence and Guardian of the Guild Pact and Profit. <laughs> it's very similar to Mono Black Control, uh, where it wants to control the board in order to set up finishers and just grind out games. It is a rough one to play against, but it's very fun to play. Then you have Elves. Almost every format has one of these. Uh, <laughs> just like Burn, right? <laughs> so Elves is going to just vomit a bunch of Elves onto the board. Notable Elves would be Priest of Titania, Lanoir Elves, Timberwatch Elf, and Quirion Ranger. So this is another one of those decks where if you liked it in Legacy or it's appealing to you, but you don't feel like paying legacy prices. You can play a very solid build in a relatively cheap format. And I think that'll about do it for today's video. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope that you found a deck that you might want to pick up and get into the format. You know, this video is for the people that are just getting started and don't really know what to play. So I hope you found something. If you would like me to take a deeper dive into one of these decks, feel free to let me know down below. And if not, I will just see you next time. Thanks for watching.